And remember what we had decided we would do earlier. What I did yesterday was to give you some background to thinking about disease models. We discussed a good fraction of, not a good fraction of, but enough that you had to know about basic biology. We discussed epidemiology. We discussed a little bit of the history behind thinking about infectious diseases and modeling. So in this lecture, what I want to do is to describe to you in some detail, with some care, what is the SIR model and various models that are related to it. So what we want to do is really, in as simple a way as possible, in general the way as possible, illustrate the idea of compartmental models, in particular this particular compartmental model, and derive from it various consequences. So the terms that you will learn, I hope, are the reproductive ratio, vaccination, herd immunity, where do oscillations come from, and what limits can we solve this particular model. And this will overlap a little bit onto what I want to do after this, which is more complex models, stochastic, spatial dependence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I want to spend a little bit of time, if I can, on vector-borne diseases, which are very important. And finally, sort of state-of-the-art network and agent-based models. So let me just, what I do in every lecture is try and review in the first 10 minutes or so, the material that I covered in the earlier lecture, just so that you're reminded of it and you sort of, you understand what you're supposed to have remembered, what you're supposed to know. So this was all of what we covered the last time. As, it, as you can see, we did cover a lot of ground. Pretty much this is almost a full quarter of a course in epidemiology and diseases. And we spent a little bit of time, about 10 minutes on each of these topics, I mean less than that, but five minutes on each of these topics. So we started off by thinking about the term mathematical epidemiology and what we wanted to accomplish by it. And then we went into a little detour about thinking about what is health and what is disease. And we said that these are terms that we sometimes take for granted, but there are many assumptions when we talk about, when we say someone is healthy, someone is diseased, etc. And there are assumptions that carry the whole way to social sanction behind them. What used to be called, what is called a disease now was not called a disease earlier. What do we mean when we t think in terms of health? Not only do we mean physical health, your limbs must all be intact, your metabolism must be okay, but also in terms of mental health, which is often neglected, truly a very important part of thinking about the health of population. Then we made this particular statement that says that the infectious diseases are very largely due to what I call pathogenic organisms. These could be bacteria, these could be viruses, these could be unicellular um, organisms that are detrimental to the human body. But the idea of a pathogen and a pathogenic organism was introduced at this point. And that's really the central thing that you need to know about pretty much most of the diseases that we will study in this talk. There are some diseases that don't fall within this ambit. First of all, any non-communicable disease does not fall into this ambit. We're only talking about infectious diseases. But there are some types of infectious diseases. For example, diseases that come from misfolded proteins. These are called prion diseases, as I mentioned earlier, that are you can actually go from person to person. And the canonical example of this is what is called the BSC epidemic or the bovine spongiform encephalopathy epidemic in the late 90s, early 2000s where people discovered that cattle, this is a disease of cattle, and that in which essentially cattle went mad, it's also called mad cow disease for that, for that reason. And this is connected to a progressive degeneration in the structure of their brain and by the accumulation of malformed or misshapen proteins. So it was discovered that you could actually, if you ate parts of an infected of a cattle infected, of a cow infected with BSC, there was a chance that you could contract it yourself. This is complicated by the fact that the time you might take to contract it could be as long as 20 years. So having had it now, it might take 20 years for you to come up with the same symptoms that someone else might achieve in a five years or eight, 10 years. So these very long incubation periods are also characteristic of the certain type of disease. The whole idea behind the fact that you could, you could get a disease through misformed or misshaped proteins got a Nobel Prize, a person who received a Nobel Prize for this, and other diseases like Alzheimer's and so on, potentially associated with the same pathology. Okay. Then from here we moved on to say that, look, it's not just the pathogen or the pathogenic organism, but how it interacts with the host that determines the nature of how the disease progresses. There are many points at which the host and pathogen interact. Where is the pathogen found? What is the medium in which it is found? What is the mode in which it transfers to the, to the human being? 
got to, is it through the air, is it through water, etc., etc. What is the life cycle of the pathogen within the human being? So concentrating exclusively on the pathogen can miss the important part of the interaction between the host. And when we talk of host, we'll mostly be talking about human beings here, as well as the pathogen. Then we spent a nice sort of 10 minutes talking about the immune response. And I said, I raised this question of, look, I've listed a lot of diseases for you, you know, all of these terrible things, the dengue, chikungunya, etc. Why is it that we're not constantly falling ill? So there I stressed the role of the immune system or the immune response. And there is a fair amount of detail, but you just need to remember that there are a few different types of major immune response. One is sort of passive immunity, in the sense that your skin gives you a passive barrier, your uh, mucous tissues gives you a passive barrier to anything that invades you from the outside. But there's also an innate immunity, the immunity that you're born with, which guards as the first line of defense against an external pathogen that comes to attack you. And then, of course, there's an even more sophisticated part of the immune system that we have developed that's called acquired immunity. And that is really the memory of all previous infections that you may have gone through that guard you against future recurrences of that same infection. So if you remember, I said that if you are, if as mathematical biologists or applied mathematicians, if you're looking for a problem to do, I might recommend looking for it in immune, the mathematics of immune response because that really is a field that is you know, sort of really yearning for good mathematical treatments. It's a very complicated, a very difficult field but that's exactly the reason why young people should go into it while they're still, while their minds are still fresh and they can still do these things. Then we discussed a history of infectious diseases. I mentioned zoonotic diseases. I referred you to the first picture that I showed you, which is the bat, the bird, the human being, the blood, etc., etc. And I told you why that was significant. Then we went on to discuss again briefly the origins of medicine, the historical origins of medicine, Indian medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, the European school, the Greek school of medicine, I mentioned the name of Hippocrates, and then we went a little bit more towards the modern age, where we talked about Harvey's theories of blood circulation, we talked about various other people who were important at that point, we talked about Pasteur, we talked about Robert Koch, and that's where we got into modern bacteriology, and mentioned the postulates, the four postulates of Robert Koch, and then discussed briefly descriptive epidemiology associated with that. Then if you remember, I talked about the epidemiological triangle, which is the host, the environment, and the pathogen together. And I said all of these interact with each other. And whenever we think about a disease, it's these three parts that interact with each other that we should be thinking about, that set the foundations of our thought about this. Then we defined certain terms that were going to be important to us. We talked about a population. And then we said often we're not interested in the whole population as such. We're interested in some sub-part of the population, which is the population at risk. And then we looked at the determinants of disease within the population of risk. Then again, we spent some time on terminology. We said that, look, anybody who thinks about disease or public health must know certain terms. First of all, must know there are different types of ways in which you can approach the epidemiology of disease. You can be descriptive, you can be analytical, you can be experimental. And other important terms are cohorts and cohort studies. We talked about longitudinal studies, we talked about retrospective studies, we talked about prospective studies, etc. And then I introduced the words pandemic and endemic. Both of these are important words to keep in mind because they'll recur. And the last bit of it was, again, back to history. And this is an example of descriptive epidemiology, which is snow in dealing with the cholera epidemic in London in the 1800s. And this is one example of how doing epidemiology actually led to a change in policy. It led to shut this particular pump down, make sure that people don't drink that water, and began to convey the idea that one determinant of how people fell ill is to be found in the environment and the way the host and the pathogen interact via this environmental route, which in this particular case happened to be water. And the last bit of what we did was move back to the history of the infectious disease that is important to us. So I spoke about Ross, about Ronald Ross and his theory of, of and his experiments on the malarial parasite, and the life cycle of the malarial parasite. Then I mentioned the bit of history about Kermack and McKendrick, who developed what we now call today the SIR model. And I showed you some data about how Kermack and McKendrick applied the SIR model to the Bombay Plague of 1900. Okay, so this is all, this is just sort of quick revision of everything that we did. You will recognize that we did a lot. It may not have seemed like a lot while you were sitting there, but this is really effectively the content of something like five weeks or six weeks of a course in epidemiology, which we have tried to compress into one lecture. And there was no mathematics in this at all. But again, as I stressed the last time, it's important that you understand basic terminology, the basic ideas, the basic biology, 
epidemiology because all of these things are important to anyone who wants to think about a field such as mathematical biology. Mathematical biology is not about mathematics alone. Mathematical biology is also very importantly about the biology and to be convincing and to talk to people who are clinicians or biologists and to say that you are, you are doing something useful for them, you need to speak their language and you still need to understand the terms that they use. And this must really is a very important part of your own growing up as a scientist or as a mathematician. Okay, so very quickly, infectious and non-infectious. These are caused by bacteria, virus or a parasite. Other people can get them from you and other people can't get them from you. Here is a list. We said cholera is a bacterium, cause disease. H1N1 is viral, dengue is viral, malaria is a parasite, HIV AIDS is a viral disease, chickenpox is a viral disease, influenza is a viral disease again. Tuberculosis is a bacterial disease. MERS is a viral disease. Ebola is, a, Ebola is a viral disease again. And pretty much most things that you read about now in the paper, they tend to be viral in nature. And they're often new viruses that the immune system has not encountered previously, which is why H1N1, for example, the human body had not encountered the particular strain of H1N1 that turned up in 2009, which is why many people fell ill, even though it's like a flu, it's H1N1 influenza, it's a particular type of influenza virus. These are all the non-infectious diseases, which I said we will not be talking about. And you need a different set of tools in order to think about them. Here's a graph that I showed you. This is the number of cases in Ebola between as of 27 November 2018. And this shows you how the confirmed cases have changed. And as I said, the question with data like this is, what is this data going to do? If I looked at, for, at 3rd of December, if I looked at 10th of December, etc., is this curve going to go up? Or has it run its course and we were expected to come down? This is important because people are dying and it's very important that you need to know what exactly is happening with this disease. Do I expect 10,000 cases in the month of January or do I expect 10 cases in the month of January? And that's really the central question that the World Health Organization, public health organizations, the, the, the government in Congo, all of these want to know the answers to these questions and that's really the job of mathematical epidemiology. Again, going over a few terms that we'll use here again. An epidemic disease is one that occurs in a population excess of its normally expected frequency of occurrence. You expect no cases of Ebola in a population, so any case of Ebola is significant. And by the time you get to numbers like 50, 100, and a graph that seems to be increasing, that's when you begin to suspect that something is going out of control, something is going out of hand, and we may have an epidemic to worry about. And as I said, in epidemic disease events are clustered in time and space. Here's an old picture of I think this is the 1919 Spanish flu. And you can see these whole lines of hospital wards of people just sort of signed up in huge numbers. As I said, India particularly felt a huge impact of that. 20 million people died. And for a population which is 1.3 billion, that's 20 million is actually a fairly large number. A disease may be epidemic even at low frequency of occurrence, provided it occurs in excess of the expected frequency. As I said, the example is Ebola. A pandemic is when an epidemic spreads outside the country or the location where it's initially found. And once it crosses the boundaries between several countries, the borders between them, that then is classified as a pandemic. H1N1 is called a pandemic because it influenced Mexico, it influenced the US, it influenced Canada, it influenced India, Hong Kong, Singapore, etc. Its reach was global and not confined to one particular area. Okay. The other term that we use, again very briefly, is the natural history of the disease, which is how does an individual go from being in good health to either recovering from the disease or dying with the intermediate phase in which the person is infected and undergoes subclinical changes and later the clinical disease, which is diagnosed in terms of the person. Okay, so here are now some new terms that I'm going to introduce to you. The first is morbidity. And morbidity is another term for illness. And if you ask how many people are affected in a particular population, or what fraction of people are affected in the population, or the risk of an individual in a population becoming affected, we talk about morbidity rates. How many people are ill at a particular time? And as time proceeds, how does that number change? How many new cases are there of people falling ill? Mortality, as you can figure out from the word, is how many people are dying. So in the context of a disease like Ebola, or something that leads almost inevitably to someone dying, you will be concerned about this particular question. What is the mortality rate? How many people have died between last week and this week? And how can I predict that? Here are two other useful words. One is incidence. And the incidence is, determines, is exactly defined as this, the number of newly diagnosed cases of a disease. And, by, and in order to mention that, I have to specify a time frame. 
So I said, how many diseases have been newly diagnosed in the last week? That would be the incidence of the disease. Incidence rate, both of these are often used interchangeably. You have to specify which population you are looking at, what time period you are looking at. And normally it's useful to scale it by the number of individuals in that particular population. So let me give you an example of a little by, but here's another useful word. Prevalence is just the number of cases that exist at a given time. Okay? So incidence is number of new cases. Prevalence is number of cases. For example, there may be new cases of Ebola in the last week, maybe 10. The prevalence, the number of people with Ebola at this time, may be 200. Okay? So that's where you have to remember that that word is useful to us as an indicator of how many people are there in the population suffering from a disease and how important is that in terms of public health? Are the numbers increasing? Are they going down? Hmm? And what is the change as a fraction of the total number per relative given time? So here's some examples. Suppose that you have a population of 4,000 cattle at a quarantine camp and there are some cases of a particular viral disease called Rinderpest, okay, when examined on a particular day. So the prevalence of Rinderpest at that camp on 18th June is 60 cases divided by the population, which is 0.015 or 1.5% or 15 cases per 1,000 animals, which is normally the way in which you specify a prevalence. So this is a little bit about Rinderpest, and you may not have heard this word. That's because this is a disease that no longer exists, and this is unusual. So it's a disease of cloven hoofed animals, for example, like cattle, it's characterized by high mortality invariably you die. And in epidemic form, it's the most lethal plague known in cattle. And until the late 20th century, that was 1900 and so on, it was endemic in a number of countries in Africa and Asia Minor, but now it has been eradicated globally. So that's an example of how public health measures can actually get rid completely of a disease. And smallpox potentially is one which has been got rid of, but you know, apart from sort of few minor cases that turn up from time to time, hopefully we will get rid of it completely. And the, if the effort is to try and do that with the other diseases that are huge burdens to the humankind. One would be malaria, one would be tuberculosis. So the question is how do we drive those number of cases to zero and ensure that they're no longer with us. Here is one example of how one can actually get rid of a disease altogether. So suppose again you take the same number of cattle in the quarantine camp, 4,000 cattle, and 600 develop symptoms of rinderpest during June. Okay? So incidence of rinderpest in the camp for June is the total number of cases during that period divided by 4,000, which is 150 new cases per 1,000 animals. So it's a, if I look at this, this is a way of measuring the risk that a susceptible individual in a population has of contacting the disease during that particular time period. Okay, so now we have access to all of these terms. We've understood what they mean. What must maths do? What does the mathematical model do? We must first answer questions like, how many cases in the population at a given time? What is the prevalence of the disease? What is the number of infected people at a time? How many new cases are there in a small time interval? This would be questions about the incidence of the disease. Are there five new cases per thousand people, one new case per thousand people, or 200 new cases per thousand people? That's another question that we might want to ask our model. What are the effects of various interventions? For example, if I vaccinated some fraction of the population, what effect would that have on the course of disease? How would my incidence change? How would the prevalence change at a given point of time? What happens if a quarantine individual is within that population who, the moment anybody falls sick or reports to the hospital, I ensure they're in an airtight room and only completely clothed and garbed health professionals go and talk to them. That would be quarantining them by reducing the frequency of their contact with anybody else in the general population. What is the effect of that particular intervention on the natural course of a disease? And finally, you could even ask more technical questions. Measles, as I showed you the last time, is a disease that at least until it was reduced, the burden of disease due to measles was vastly reduced by vaccination, by the MMR vaccination. Until then, fairly regularly every year, you had peaks in the incidence of measles. So that suggests a seasonal effect. And you can ask your model to be able to even think about the effects of seasonality. How does that induce periodicity in epidemics of a particular disease? So now with that longish introduction, just to remind you about things that introduce a few new terms and to sort of set the stage for what we want to try and understand about disease, let's now move on to compartmental models for infectious disease, which is the main topic of these lectures. So as I said, these two people, one died in 48, one died in 70, invented the SIR model of infectious diseases and in general set the stage for compartmental models for disease transmission.
So let's think about it in this manner. First of all, consider a population of individuals. Individuals are heterogeneous. Each one of you is not like anyone else in this particular room. But when we think about them in relation to the disease, it's obvious, fairly obvious, that a very minimal way of thinking about them is either these are individuals who are susceptible to the disease, are already infected by the disease, or potentially could have recovered from the disease after being infected. Okay? So here are the S's. And the understanding here is that we don't worry about the pathogen at this time, about the dynamics of the pathogen, what is doing inside the human body, although we know that the interaction between host and pathogen is very important. These are models that think about it only from the point of view of the host and the nature of the state of the host. Okay? So what we're going to do is going to take these and put them into little boxes, which we call compartments. So the compartments are susceptible, which is not exposed, not infected, but can become infected. Okay? The infectious category is a person, an individual, someone in this box who can transmit the infection to someone else. And the recovered box is people who have recovered from the infection and will not be susceptible again. Okay? There are classes of diseases where after recovering, you can go back to being susceptible. For example, the common cold, if you have a cold this year, there's no guarantee that you will not get a cold next year. It may not be exactly the same cold, but we will call it the cold to make things simple. Sometimes the recovered is also called removed. Okay? And that's a sort of euphemism. We're not sure what happened to them. Either they recovered or something else could have happened to them. So this is what I mean by compartments. This is these little boxes here. I will put all the susceptible people into this compartment. I will say there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 people in that one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, 8 people in that particular compartment, in the susceptible compartment. There are 4 people in the infected compartment and there are 5 people in the recovered compartment. So every individual I'm going to put in one of these 3 little boxes or compartments. So I can label them as S, I and R. And these little boxes, S, I, and R, are going to be my basic variables. Okay? Now, the total number of people in these three boxes, as I said, every individual in the population that you want to study who is at risk can be put into one of these boxes. If I add the number 8 plus 4 plus 5 here, I should get to a total of 8 plus 4 plus 5 individuals, 12 plus 17 individuals between these three boxes, and that is my N. Okay? And the if provided the population is closed, that I don't have people entering here at various points, either by immigration from outside or by new births in either one of these categories, in the S category typically, then the number remains fixed. So S plus I plus R <coughs> is N, which is now a fixed number. It sometimes helps to divide this by N. So this is a fraction of people in that particular susceptible compartment, the fraction of people in the infected compartment, and the fraction of people in the recovered compartment. Okay? All right, so what happens when you fall ill? What is going on here? So imagine that you're going forward in time. Up to this point, you're completely healthy, but somewhere along here, you encounter a point of infection. That's when a virus, let us say, or a bacterium, enters you by some means. Once viruses or bacteria enter your body, if typically your immune system has not dealt with them yet, doesn't clear it out immediately, then the virus begins to multiply and its numbers increase. So the number of viruses here at any given time point is called the viral load. There are ways of quantifying how many virus particles that you have. So it's, there are ways of just essentially counting the number of viruses in your bloodstream. That number is something that might go up here at this point. And once it crosses a certain threshold, that differs for different people. Some people fall, feel sick very easily. Some people take a long time to practically half dead before they admit that they're actually ill. So the exact zone of this point depends a little bit on what clinical criterion you choose to apply, as well as how individuals respond to what they call illness. Illness is a personal perception of disease. So you can say that between this point and this point where the viral load is large is when people are most likely to feel ill. That's when they demonstrate illness. But after that, this is when your, your immune system kicks in and begins to remove the virus from your system. So typically, there are antibodies that are specific to parts of the virus. A virus is a very interesting structure. Viruses tend to be small. They display certain proteins on their surface. And the act of the immune system, of the adaptive immune system, is to recognize those certain shapes of proteins and generate antibodies that can bind to them. 
so that they can be recognized and killed by other types of cells. Okay. So the antibodies against this viral infection start out here, they ramp up their production here, and by the time they get to the stage, there's a lot of antibody in your bloodstream that is effective against this particular virus or against protein molecules that are contained on the surface of this particular virus. And once this happens, once your viral load goes down, after that, you begin to be well again. So if we look at this, at this point, you're susceptible. You can be susceptible for years to a particular infection. At this point, where you haven't fallen ill yet, you don't have the sensation of illness yet, but yet the virus particles are multiplying, that is a latent state, or you could even call it an exposed state. Finally, the state here is called an infectious state. It's not just the point where you feel sick, but at the point where the viral particles have accumulated in such, to such an extent that you can transfer them effectively to other people. And finally, over here, you have lots of antibodies in your system. If that virus comes back, you will clear it out immediately. At this point, you are now immune. And your immunity can last for decades, depending upon, it can last lifelong, depending upon what disease it actually is. So the period here, you can be susceptible for years, you can be in a latent state for days, you can be infectious for days, but again, you can be immune for decades. So it's really a fairly short interval, the time in which you fall sick and the time in which you recover. Here is a representation of this in terms of compartments. So the point here where the infection starts, you're in the susceptible compartment. You can be in the susceptible compartment for years. At this point here where the viral load is beginning to build up, but you still are not infectious to other people, is a state that you will call E. So that's the exposed state here. That's the latent state as far as the virus is concerned. The point between here and here where the viral load has reached such a level that you can transmit to other people, this is called the infective period. And this is the point at which the person who is infected can convey that infection to other people. Finally, beyond here is when you say that, look, the immune system has peaked up, the viral load has come down, you're below the abundance required for transmission. And this is the point at which you recover. It's interesting to note that often the point at which you show your symptoms is not really before this. It's pretty much late into the whole thing. And much of the systems that you show are really your immune system acting up. It's not because a virus or, or, uh, or, or bacterium is doing terrible things to you. It's really your immune system in response or attacking the virus or bacterium that is provoking an immune response sort of makes you feel miserable for various reasons. And we can go into the medical reason why that's so. But that's really the start of its symptoms here which can actually be fairly well separated from the start of infection. So you can actually have people walking around who are infectious to other people, even though they themselves may not feel particularly sick. Okay? All of this you know is part of your general experience and just reminding you of this in a more formal setting. Okay, so that earlier picture showed you a compartment for susceptible, a compartment for exposed, a compartment for infected, and a compartment for recovered, S-E-I-R. So now we've gone one step further from susceptible, infected and recovered. The next important term that we'll use here is a term called demographics. And demographics in general is a term that describes the fact that populations can change. How can they change? Because new people are being born. The other way they can change is because old people are dying and often young people might also die. So there are ways in which you can lose people from these. For example, here a susceptible person has died, infected person has died, a recovered person has died subtracting from the population. But typically here you can have one susceptible person being added to the population there. And that's true, for example, through a birth. And when you're born, usually you're susceptible. Apart, your, your immunity lasts for a little while, maybe a sort of few weeks to months, because your mother's antibodies are conveyed to you. But pretty much after a few months, you have to manage on your own. You're grown up enough to do that. And that's when you become susceptible to the sorts of diseases we will be thinking about. Often for models, you'll have to be a little more specific depending upon the disease. So here was S, E, I, and R, but now there's an additional little layer here called the carrier layer. And that is when you have enough viral load to be able to infect other people, but you don't fall sick or you don't feel sick and you don't classify yourself as being ill. You certainly would not be called infectious in that category. You are infectious, but you show no outward signals of that disease and your contacts with other people are not influenced by the fact that you have a fairly high viral load within you. So one example of this is a person called Typhoid Mary. This is a, this is a sort of historical figure in America who was a carrier of typhoid. So she used to work in restaurants and wherever she worked, mysteriously people would begin to fall very sick with typhoid. 
So the whole, so she sort of, the police would get hold of her, then she would sort of vanish and turn land up in some other place, and new cholera cases would be reported, you know, typhoid cases would be reported from that point, etc. So she was a carrier. She was not sick. She had not recovered. But she was in a state where she maintained a fairly high level of, of the, the, the bacterium associated with cholera and was traditionally in this state. Here's one last example before I give up on, on just naming compartments. Susceptible, exposed, infected, hospitalized. You might want to treat people who move to hospitals and are treated in hospitals different from the general population. Because when you're, once you're in a hospital, you don't meet the normal public anymore. You really meet doctors, healthcare professionals, all of whom hopefully are careful enough to take protective measures, wash their hands, use antiseptic, etc., etc., that prevent them from falling ill. This is an additional state, and this is an interesting state, and there's a story behind this. You might think that recovered are people removed from the recovered or removed are people not in the population anymore you would imagine that if you're dead you're not in that population you shouldn't be counted so why would one want to introduce a dead compartment there the reason is ebola because even after you're dead if you're an ebola patient you can potentially transfer your infection to other people as i said ebola comes is transmitted through bodily fluids and as you are being if ultimate care is not taken in preparing you for burial, which is what happens in West Africa, then your bodily fluids, even though you're dead, can transfer to the person who's moving you around. And that's why even in the dead state, you have the potential of infecting people. Okay? I'm sorry, this is all very grim, but some part of diseases are like that. The main approximation that we will make, and towards the end of these lectures, I will tell you how to improve on this, is to consider what is called a well-mixed population. That really says that any infected person, any recovered person, etc., has some equal probability of contacting anybody else in that population. And we will come back to the specific utility of this approximation a little later, and we'll describe ways in which we can tune it as we go along. But this is certainly an important assumption of all compartmental models, that the probability of anybody contacting anybody else is the same. The word well mixed comes from the fact that if you have a chemical reaction that happens in a beaker, if you want that reaction, if you stir the beaker vigorously, that typically any molecule of A has a chance to, to interact with any molecule of B. So a well-stirred beaker is also called a well-mixed beaker, accounts really for that same population. You don't have a little group of A sitting here, a little group of B here, because you mix them all up by stirring it. Let's start with the simplest type of model, which is called the SI model. And just, we will do SIR, but here is a version that's even simpler than the SIR model. That is, you have a susceptible person moving to an infected state, but the infected state can move back and become susceptible again. So the cold is one example. We sort of treat cold as some generic disease that you can get. Because you can fall ill with things that superficially are the same, even though the virus may not be exactly similar. So you can be susceptible, become infected, recover, go back to being susceptible again, go back to being infected. This is the SI model. And the terminology that I will use, the arrows are S going to I, but these dots here reflect an influence. So the presence of infected people influences the transition between S and I. And a lot of the work that we have to do in the modeling is to decide the form of that influence that that influence will actually take. Okay. Here in its full glory, in the picture, is the SIR model. As I said, three states, the susceptible state, the infected state, and the recovered state. And here is the progression. You progress from S to I, I to R. You never move backward. You never move from I to S. You never move from recovered back to I. And the dotted line here says, the presence of infected people influences the transition of from susceptible to infectious compartments. It's completely obvious when I draw it in pictures of this form. The next step would logically be to try and convert this into an equation. Here is what happens in the SEIR model, the susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered, where the infected arrow here can influence the transition between susceptible and exposed over here. So that's the influence arrow, as opposed to the dark arrows which tell you in which direction you're actually moving. Yeah. Um, that's just, that's just the way I've drawn it in terms of sequence. In the, in the sequence, susceptible comes before infected. But it's the presence of infected that influences the rate at which susceptible becomes exposed. So, I mean, it, it, the logic is the logic of the progression between the compartments. 
And given that progression, only something that is infected can influence something that is susceptible. Slightly louder, slightly louder. Because if then that would be the, called the SIS model, where once you recover, if you can go back to being susceptible, I can call this susceptible. So that's another type of model called the SIS model. Okay. Because the presence of susceptibles, the total number of susceptibles can change as a consequence of the infectious. But if there are no infectious people at all, a susceptible person can never become infected. Yes, I agree. Absolutely true. No, because in that case there is no S at all here. Then you are only worried about I and R. So now you have got rid of your S compartment completely. Everybody in that population is either in the I compartment or the R compartment. There are no new people coming into that population. So I can forget about this altogether. Nobody can fall ill because everybody has already fallen ill. So this arrow will, so we'll have to figure out what that form that should take. But this just says that the presence of infected people influences the rate at which susceptibles become infected. Yes, you might guess that the more the number of infected people are, the greater the chances that the susceptible person will move into the infected compartment. Yeah. All right, so that's again the SEIR model with the arrow here. There are also interesting possibilities. So I think one of you raised this point of why didn't I have going back to susceptible. The answer is the other way you can have it, either SIS or SI, is to say that maybe the immunity that you gain in the recovered state is not a permanent immunity. Maybe it lasts for, for 7 years or 10 years, but after some time you move back into the S compartment. So if you move back, remember our, our notation is we have a dark arrow here. So even though the I to S, the S to I is influenced by this dashed arrow here, you can actually move back from R to S. That's an example of the case where you have an immune, waning immunity. Here's an even more complicated situation. And that is when you have births of children, where you, as I mentioned, that you have some part of your immunity that comes from your mother. So this is called vertical transmission. This is called horizontal transmission, horizontal incidence here. So the vertical transmission is from the mother giving birth to a child with passive immunity. After some time, that child moves from here to the susceptible compartment and then the whole sort of susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, etc. transmission actually happens. So you can have mothers who both have immunity as well as mothers who don't have immunity. So both into M and S you can have a vertical transfer. You can have people of course dying from here, dying from here, dying from here, dying from here, dying from here. And that's part of demographics of changes in the numbers of population that occur through births and deaths. So typically there are antibodies that are transferred by the mother to the child and after the antibodies are removed from the body, infants move to susceptible class and those without passive immunity enter as directly, which is what this particular statement is here. So, these deaths are not only due to infection, there could be deaths due to infection here. For example, some fraction of the transfer of, from infected to recovered I said you could use recovered or, re or replaced or removed or something. Some of them could be deaths due to infection. Some of them could be natural deaths. So all I've done now, until now is just draw pictures for you. And that's in a sense basic to thinking about this. You've given a disease, you have to understand what is my term? The natural history of the disease. What, how does that disease affect a person? And within that person, how does that disease multiply and what are the effects of that person? Does it have a long exposed period? Does it have a short incubation period? Is there an exposed state? Is there a recovered state? Should I worry about the person after they're dead? All of these are mental building blocks by which you build up a model like this. For every disease, they are different. The way you deal with Ebola is different from the way you deal with leprosy, is different from the way you deal with TB. Each of them have, you can have to justify which shape of model you will use in order and how these different blocks put together and with their arrows, what influences who, how does these fractions move between the different compartments, 
But that's the function of the basic philosophy of writing down compartmental models. All right, good. So now let's get a little more mathematical about our treatment and see what it is that we're trying to do. Here are these numbers. We want to ask, how do they change in time? The question of asking how does something change in time is a question about the derivative ds by dt. So the simplest way of saying it, how do the number of people in the susceptible compartment change in time? What is ds by dt? And this is some function of the only variables in the problem, s, i, and r. These are the only things that can actually matter. The only thing that you can say about this function is if i is 0, there are no infected people at all, then ds by dt must be 0, assuming that no one is dying and no one is being born, because there's nobody around to infect you anymore. You have to be susceptible unless there's somebody to infect you. So that's the only sort of hint that we have. And really, the number of recovered should not affect change the number of susceptibles. That's again a sort of hint that seems natural, which you must codify into our model. But how to write down the di by dt? How does the number of infected people change as a function of time? That's an interesting question. And there's some other function here. So constructing f1, f2, and f3 is going to be the job of describing the SIR model in equations. So first of all, what are s, i, and r? Are they numbers or are they densities? Are they number of people per unit area, for example? Or are they total number of people in a given area? Either I can choose to vary both the area and the number in different ways. But the question is, what is the language that I will use to describe? This is the same number of people in two different areas. The reason that this might be different is you might think that if you have the same number of people in a much larger area, you tend to contact each other less. So if you have a disease that spreads through contact, it's obviously a better situation than that. But there's another bit of logic that goes into doing this, which is if you say that if you want to think of the interaction between susceptible and infected as a chemical reaction, then you would say if A was susceptible and B was infected, in order to get infections, you know that infected and susceptible people must encounter each other. The way you would write the rate of this equation is some reaction rate, A to the number of molecules of A, B to the number of molecules of B, and this would be the rate at which you generate these products, E and D, the forward reaction. That's kind of the logic here. If you think of INS as numbers of individuals per unit area, more dense population gives rise to more contacts between people. More contacts between susceptible infected people give rise to more people developing that particular disease. And over here, if you do this, you notice that the term beta, over here that enters here, has the dimensions of an area per unit time. The traditional word for this is mass action. And mass action derives from the approximation that you make to write down the reaction rate of this form. So I'm, you will see reactions like this pretty much a large part of next week which deals with systems biology, and you've probably already seen it in, in Shitabu's lectures. And it's really trying to see how different components interact with each other in this particular way. So there are many technical terms. So some it's called mass action, it's sometimes called density-dependent transmission. Sometimes nowadays it's called pseudo-mass action. If, if you don't think of this as densities, but if you think of these as numbers, so it can't be precisely mass action. So what does thinking about this mean? It means the following that the rate at which s changes, ds by dt, is proportional to the number of infected people and the number of susceptible people. Okay? There must be enough susceptible people to get an infection. The more the number of susceptible people, the more an infected person can infect in the first place. But if I have no infected people at all, then ds by dt must be 0 because there is nobody to infect. Okay? So I can convert the proportionality into an equality and write ds by dt is minus beta i times s. So minus beta is is my logic for writing the change of the number of people in the susceptible compartment. Okay? I'm assuming that it's all well mixed. Whether they're successful or not, go into the definition of beta. Maybe all are successful. Maybe all are not successful. That depends upon what I define to be my beta. Beta is just some number that I have now that characterizes the disease. Among them, the contacts, the success of those contacts, and the period of those contacts. Okay? Why the minus sign? Because the number is decreasing. The number in susceptible compartment is going down. Therefore, ds by dt must be negative because both i and s are positive. They're just numbers. So the rate at which new infections occur in a population is the product of the contact rate, the rate at which people contact each other, the proportion of these contacts that are with susceptibles for infected people, and the proportion of such contacts that actually result in infection. So these are these three questions that you raised. How many contacts am I making?
how many of them are with susceptible people if I am infected, and how many of those contacts are productive in the sense of actually leading to an infection. So the assumption that underlies what I wrote down is that contact rate is directly proportional to the density. There's a second interpretation that says the contact rate is independent of the density. Okay? And this assumes that if susceptible infected hosts were randomly mixed, the transmission term would be not beta si, but beta si divided by m. And the logic is that each susceptible s makes the same number of contacts regardless of host density. And a proportion i by n of these are with infected hosts. Okay? This is called frequency dependent transmission. So let me just try and explain a little bit about that particular term here. And I'll do that by introducing a new phrase which is important, and that's called the force of infection. So in epidemiology, the force of infection is the rate at which susceptible individuals acquire an infectious disease. So that's ds by dt on the left hand side. Okay? So the way I'm going to define the force of infection says ds by dt is proportional to s, certainly, because the population is well mixed. The number of people falling in must be proportional to the total number of people anyway. It all hides in the assumptions that I make regarding lambda. So the two methods that I pointed out, the frequency dependent transmission method, lambda is beta times i by n, but with descent density dependent transmission, the first example that I showed you, it's beta times i. So it's proportional to the fraction of the population that is infected in this case. It's proportional to the number in the population that is infected. So let me see again here the definition once more here and here you can ask the question why what determines how you will choose between these two alternatives and that comes down to how do you expect behavior to in a sense scale with the size of the system if you had frequency dependent transmission that implies that 10 infected in a population of 10,000 is kind of the same as 100 infected in a population of 100,000 because the fraction of infected is the same 10 to the whatever, yeah, 10 in 10,000, 100 in 100,000, okay. In practical terms or empirically, because finally this is a question of how much, how do people contact each other, this really seems to be the case and the number of contacts that you make don't scale with the population size. So whether you are in, no, whether you are in Dharavi or whether you are in Chennai or somewhere else, typically the number of people that you know are in contact with that number is roughly the same. And it doesn't depend if, if 10 million new people join your community. The number of people that you know stays roughly the same. And that's really the, the approximation or the thinking that governs frequency dependent transmission. But I should also point out that this is a controversial part of the literature. So what we have here, this is some proposed forms by various people for the nature of the force of infection term. So this is what we said earlier, beta si is a term that appears to the right hand side. This is what I called mass action or pseudo mass action or density dependent transmission. Beta si by n is frequency dependent transmission. There are other terms that beta times s to the power p i to the power q, where p and q are to be determined by some sort of experimental analysis. There are other terms here that reduce the number n to n minus 1 by q, let's reduce this particular factor here. And then there are even more complicated terms that people have introduced to try and understand how populations interact with each other in, an, in terms of the contacts between people, the efficiency of transmission and so on. So usually this is the most common assumption, but that should not blind you to the fact that other people have thought of many other options. And in some particular cases, these may fit the situation that you're studying a little better. All right. So we said ds by dt for s into i by n. This is frequency dependent transmission. This is the final form that it takes. And look at this, the minus sign says the number of susceptibilities decreases. Beta here, because s, i, and n are pure numbers, ds by dt has a dimension of 1 over time. Beta must have a dimension of 1 over time as well. So that's the dimension of the quantity beta. i by n, as I said, is fraction of the infectious population. And now, having figured out what ds by dt is, we can now figure out the last part of it, which is, what is dr by dt? So where do recovered people come from? They come from the fact that people who are infected recover. Let's say that that happens with some rate gamma. So dr by dt is proportional to gamma times i, or equal to gamma times i. The more the number of infected people, the more the number of people recovering from that infection. So which is why we can write that particular form there. So 
this gamma here, so this is that equation that I wrote down, has the interpretation of being an average, this is a rate of recovery, the inverse of the rate is a period, so the average infectious period is 1 over gamma. And now I can put all of these things in. So we started off by saying that, look at this middle equation, how do the number of infected, the susceptible people change, the top equation. Susceptible people change because they are in contact with infected people. All those who are lost from the susceptible compartment must go into the infected compartment. So any minus sign here must appear as exactly the same term with a plus sign. Okay? Because I have taken from here and put it in there. So whatever I lose from here, I must gain here. Whatever I lose from the infected compartment because people recover, so the minus gamma times i, I must put into the recovered compartment which is plus gamma i. So these are the famous SIR equations shown here for the first time. Most of you have seen them in some form before. Let me just point out some things that are actually fairly obvious. That is, let me add up these terms, ds by dt plus di by dt plus dr by dt. So notice that this cancels this, this cancels this, therefore this gives me 0. So d by dt of s plus i plus r must be 0. But that has to be the case because s plus i plus r is a constant, which is the total number of people in the population. Okay? This assumes that there are no births or deaths and that the total number added across each compartment remains a constant. So the average infectious period is 1 over gamma. Gamma, as I said, has units of a rate per unit time. Typically, the period might be about 3 days, so gamma is 1 by 3rd of a day, 1 by 3 days. Beta also has units of a rate, as we figured out from here. So beta by gamma is a dimensionless number. In a sense, it's the only really useful number in this. Because I can always get rid of gamma. How do I do that? By just redefining the unit of time that I use. What is a unit of time? I say per day, per hour, per minute, etc. But I can just snuggle this gamma back into the definition of this time here and get rid of it. It doesn't appear at all in my equations. In just some new variable t tilde, which is gamma times t, which is then dimensionless. I can then write all of these as ds by d tilde, di by d tilde, dr by d tilde. And the only quantity that actually enters these equations is now beta by gamma, which is dimensionless quantity. Because everything else, the t tilde variable has no dimensions. The R variable has no dimension, the I variable has no dimension, the S variable has no dimension. Anything that is dimensionless on the left hand side must be equal to something that is dimensionless on the right hand side. Therefore, the only way, you cannot have beta and gamma appearing separately. The only way they can appear is beta divided by gamma. So that's an interesting and remarkable insight about these equations. There are three equations that I wrote down, thinking in the very simple way about compartmental models. But there is only one variable that characterizes the behavior of these equations. And that is a dimensionless quantity, beta divided by gamma. Okay? All right. So now I can go one step further, and this is the notation that I would use in this lecture. I can define S, redefine S. Sometimes people call this small s, as capital S divided by N. Capital numbers were usually numbers to the whole population, 10,000 people, etc. And this is now a fraction of the full population. So the, these fractions go only between 0 and 1, because they're divided by N appropriately. So once I do that, I just call this capital S again, but I hope that won't confuse you, it's just an abuse of notation. This new S plus I plus R is now equal to 1, because it's all been normalized by N. And these are what the equations look like, they look the same. It's only the interpretation that is different. These are now fractions of the total population. And note that I, S, I and R must always be less than or equal to 1. They must also be greater than or equal to 0. So S, I and R must lie exactly in this band between 0 and 1 separately, and they must add up to 1. Okay, so technically speaking, only two of those variables are independent because I can always get the third variable by appealing to the fact that they must sum up to one. So given a disease, a given disease is characterized by the beta and gamma which appear in these particular equations. So now the question behind is there an epidemic or not can be reduced to the following question. If there are a few persons who are present initially and who are infected, what determines if the disease will, be, will spread? And then I can ask, how many people will be infected as a result of the disease spreading? Can the infection recur in the population after dying out once? Can it come back at any point? And what does immunization do? And these are questions that I intend to query the system of equations with. So you can take these equations and run them on a computer. These equations cannot be solved. And they can't be solved essentially because the nonlinear term, the S times I that appears, both here and here. But solving a system of, of linear coupled ordinary differential equations, of nonlinear 
coupled ordinary differential equation, the job that is easily given to a computer. So let's ask what happens. So I'm here, I'm not telling you what the beta and gamma is. We'll repeat this for different values of, of beta and gamma. But look at what is shown here. So this line here, the blue line, is the number of susceptible people. So these equations are solved with the assumption that there is one infectious individual present in a population that almost entirely susceptible. Almost meaning minus that one particular. So the canonical question about diseases in the way the simplest way that we will think about it is what happens, how does a disease spread if I introduce one infected person into an otherwise fully susceptible population? We can refine this in many ways. If it's not one person, suppose it's 10 people, then what happens? Or 100 people, what happens? If the population has many degrees of susceptibility, some people are more susceptible, some people are less susceptible, how do these answers change? We can ask that. But those are all higher order questions. So right now, what we're showing here is, at this point, there are some large number of susceptible people at t equal to zero. There is one infected person, that is this green color, it sits here, green or red color, this sits here. And now you can see, as you move forward in time, the number of infected people actually goes up. So it goes up cheaply until it reaches this point, and at this point it saturates and then begins to come down. What happens after this point is, these people are now recovering, so they're sort of slowly being removed out of the infectious compartment, and this is the recovery line here. So the recovery starts off like this, it moves up here, and at this point you have some fraction of people who have recovered, and some fraction of people who are in this blue category, and maybe a tiny little tail of people who are still infected, even after all that time. Notice that this graph must have the following interesting property, that if I sum along any vertical line, this number plus this number plus this number, this has to add to 1. So it's only the relative ratio of people in the different compartments, or the fractions in the different compartments, that can change. So now, as I said, we can get rid of gamma because, as I said, you can always absorb gamma into the definition of a time scale and worry only about beta by gamma. And so this is taking gamma to be 1 and varying beta from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And what's plotted here is a fraction of infected between 0 and 1. This is with the smallest value of beta. So beta equal to 0 is very boring. This one infected person goes off completely. Beta equal to 1 is, I think, this line here, where you have sort of gradual hump and then it comes down. And as I increase my beta, I go from this curve to 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 this curve. The larger the beta is, the sh more sharply this curve takes off, and the higher the peak value. The peak value shifts to smaller and smaller time. So the larger the beta, the earlier you encounter the peak in the infection. And the larger the beta, the higher the number, the fraction of people who are infected. By the time I get to beta equal to 9, I've already ensured that the peak infection is something like 0.65, 65% of the population is infected at the peak point. Okay? So if I was thinking about a particular disease, it would obviously be very important to me, look, the Ebola cases, are they representative of this curve or this curve or this curve or this curve or this curve? Because that will tell me what is the peak value that I can expect, what is the fraction of the population that I can expect to be affected as a consequence of this data. The second thing that you can note, which we will spend a large amount of time on, is that the nature of the curve is somewhat different. This is the curve that is for beta equal to 0. This is the curve for beta equal to 1. But by the time you get to beta equal to 2, you begin to have this peak. So 0 and 1, basically, they come down. 0, if 1 is kind of harder to tell, it sort of seems to go kind of flattish here. But beta equal to 0 or anywhere less than 1 is something that comes down from its initial value of one person infected. Once you get to beta larger than one, that's when this curve takes off. It started off small, it gets bigger before becoming small again. So there is obviously some at least reasoning from these graphs. There may be some threshold value of beta that distinguishes whether infection will first increase or whether it will come down. And that, again, sort of guessing from here, is somewhere between zero and one. It's unlikely to be larger than 1. So what is that threshold value and how do we understand that? So let's start with di is a slightly different form, beta s minus gamma times i. It's the same equation. We said i is 1 or very small. So there's just be some epsilon. But let's just take it to be 1. And since these are fractions, 
almost the whole population is susceptible in the beginning. So S is very close to 1, I is very small. And we want to ask, what is di by dt2? So di by dt is beta, I said S equal to 1, beta minus gamma times i. And now I can ask the question, does di by dt increase or does di by dt come down? And that depends upon the sign of beta minus gamma. If beta is greater than gamma, di by dt increases. If, di, if beta is less than gamma, this becomes negative, di by dt decreases. So that's the curve that went down and the curve that went up. And that's really a question of is beta by gamma less than 1 or greater than 1. Remember that we looked at these equations and we said all of the behavior of this equation is in one particular combination of variables. Which these equations contain two variables, beta and gamma, but only one combination is important to the solution, that is beta divided by gamma. So this is the question of is beta by gamma less than 1 or is beta by gamma greater than 1. And if beta by gamma is greater than 1, then this quantity is greater than 0, and di by dt will therefore increase. And this is so important, this particular ratio, that it has its own symbol. It's called R0. And this is called the basic reproductive ratio. Okay? So the basic reproductive ratio, the definition for the simple SIR model, relied on the ratio of two variables. One described how the rate at which infected people recovered. And the second described the rate at which, in fact, the contacts between infections and susceptible people lead to susceptible people becoming infected. So that was a beta, and the earlier one was a gamma. And it's only beta by gamma, the dimensionless number, which is called R0, that determines the nature of the disease and whether it will spread. Let's look a little bit at the interpretation of this quantity. Let's go back to the old equation di by dt is beta minus gamma. I took s equal to 1 here. I can take the gamma out here and put the gamma, as I said, I can always scale it out, call this gamma t, and then call it d tilde. I get this beta by gamma is r0 minus 1. So di by dt is r0 minus 1 times i. Let me set i equal to 1 person over there. d tilde is, again, 1, 1 unit of time in the units that I've described here. So i at time t plus 1 minus 1, which is the time at t equal to 0 at the previous time, is r0. So remove the minus 1 i at time t plus 1 is r0 if I start with 1 plus. Okay? This is an example of something called exponential growth. The fact that the number increases once I have one infected person, two, three, etc. And here's this old story. I don't know. I'm sure pretty much everybody's heard about it. You know the story about this, the courtier of the king who, the king was very happy with him and he asked him, Ask me anything, I will give it to you. And he said, yeah, you know, I don't really want anything, but some very minor thing. Just give me one grain, take a chessboard and give me one grain of rice. And you put it on the first lock. In the second, you put two grains of rice. On the third, you put four grains of rice. On the fourth, you put eight grains of rice. And just keep going on. All I want is the rice that is contained on that chessboard. This looks like a sort of very trivial problem. It's two, four, eight, sixteen. These are numbers that you think you can deal with. But actually, this is a function that exponentially increases. And if you're interested, you should actually do what this calculation of what is 2 to the 64 minus 1. It turns out to be the amount of rice that is larger than the height of Mount Everest. And the king, of course, quickly realizes that. And there is some difference of opinion about whether the king was executed or executed the courtier or whether he survived after that for being so clever with this. But that's just an example of what exponential growth can do. And whether R0 is greater than 1 is you enter this exponentially growing phase where you increase very sharply before saturating and then coming down, or do you not enter that? And that's really what you call an epidemic, an exponentially increasing number of cases as the time goes on. So if the basic reproductive ratio is greater than 1, the number of infected will grow rapidly initially. So here are some numbers for diseases. Ebola reproductive ratio is 2, swine flu is 2, HIV is 4, smallpox is 7, measles is 18. That's the sort of number of people. And provided it's greater than 1, you would still call it an epidemic or potential for actually becoming an epidemic. And of course, this is how the curve increases for different values of 1.5, 2.5. So you're, you're not able to see it turning over yet on this particular graph. And the reason, of course, it turns over is that people recover, are removed, and there are fewer people to infect at later times. It's not because you run out of susceptible people, but because people are removed. People, the number of people you cannot infect again are removed from the population. They fall in the R category. Interesting question. Why is Ebola, since we hear so much about it and people dying about it, why is the reproductive ratio for Ebola 2? That's a small number compared to the number for measles, which is 18. What happened there? 
The answer is that it's very easy to get measles. If there is one person in this room with measles, and you're here for about an hour and a half, two hours, and this person is walking around, and all of you, if you have not had your MMR shots, you're almost sure to get measles. There's no question about it. It's very efficiently transmissible. Its transmiss transmission is airborne. Ebola, you have to struggle a bit in the sense you actually need physical contact with that person in order to transfer body. It's not as though if you are there and I'm here and you are an Ebola patient, I will not get Ebola from you. If you are there and I'm here and you are a measles patient and I'm susceptible, I will almost surely get it from you. Which is why, and measles again I stress because that's an important disease. Because measles is an example of a disease where increasingly people, especially in the Western world but also in India, are refusing to take their regular vaccination for inoculations. And the measles vaccination that comes MMR, measles, mumps and rubella vaccination that you get, is one example of a vaccination that people are just refusing to let their kids do. The reason for that goes to some complicated prehistory. Of the vaccination, there's a very, very small percentage of people, maybe one in 100,000 or something, who actually will fall ill because of that. The reasons for that are not very well known. Is there some genetic predisposition to a bad effect about, upon the vaccine and so on? It's not very clear how that happens, but that certainly is true. And the second reason is that there are various people who say that, look, these vaccines are bad because they could cause autism in your children. Autism, you know, that, and there was a famous paper in, which was published in, I think, The Lancet, which made this connection between the MMR vaccination and autism in children. And of course, you know that diagnoses of autism have gone up in the last sort of few decades. But that is pretty much largely because people are more aware of the nature of the disease and more aware of the need for get treatment or going to a doctor to see whatever can be done in terms of that particular disease. So it's not, so just increases in a number are not sufficient to establish a causal relationship between one and the other. And that paper was later withdrawn, but by then it had done much of its harm. And there is a whole cottage industry of people who go around telling other people that you should never vaccinate your children, it's very bad for you, etc. But long term, this has very bad consequences for our population. Deaths due to, if you remember the earlier graph I showed, I showed you a graph of deaths with, of measles as a function of time in Australia, the UK, US. And you saw these numbers of 80 to 100 deaths that were a consistent feature across the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, until the time that the vaccination was introduced. And that, that number plummets to zero. Okay, So it's important to understand that anti-vaccination campaigns, apart from many, many things, are really genuinely public health issues. And that's another thing that people who think about public health must worry about. Okay, back to these equations again. Let's think a little bit about R0. Now that we know what R0 is, R0 is the number of secondary cases that one infected individual can give rise to. So what ought to go into R0? First of all, how long do you remain infectious has to go into R0. The longer you remain infectious, the more people you can infect. If you're infected, if you're infectious only for one day, the number of people you meet in that day is an upper limit to the number of people you can actually infect. If you're infectious for 100 days, there are 100 times more people that you can actually infect in that period. This second term here is the average rate of contact between susceptible and infectious individuals. Okay? In this case, it's one infectious individual with the susceptible background here. And that tells you it's a measure of how many people you meet. This is a rate of contact. This is per day. I multiply this by a duration, which is a day. I get a number that is this. The number of people an infectious person comes into contact with over the time period that they are infectious. Is that clear with that definition? I must now multiply this by one more quantity, which is the dimensionless number. And that is the probability that any one of those contacts actually leads to the transmission of disease from an infected person to a susceptible person. So this is the probability of infection given a contact between susceptible and infectious person. Multiply this by the rate of contact. Multiply this by how long you remain infected. That will tell you how many people you will infect or once one infectious person can infect as time goes on. And this really is the same as R0, the interpretation of R0 that I told you earlier. So if you ask, take those equations and you say, okay, let me look at them as a function of R0, that's the only variable I have here. What? Let me count the fraction of infected that I have. So that's the peak value 
that I showed you in that earlier graph. You had an infected number that went up and then came down. Right between 0 and 1, there is no peak value. The infection dies down. But the moment I cross R0 equal to 1, the number of fraction infected goes up. Goes up. Until finally, for large enough R0, pretty much the whole population is actually infected. So sorry, it's not the peak, but the integral of that curve, the integral of the infected is the number of times that counts the total number of infected that I have here. This is the infection of the interpretation of R0. We've been through that just now. Here are some things that are you need to worry about when you think about models for disease. We chose a particularly simple form. We just said that people move out of compartments at fixed rate. Okay? We said here is the rate at which in fact people move from the susceptible compartment to the, to the infected compartment, the rate at which you move from the infected compartment to the recovered compartment. So if you write things in terms of rates, the number that changes is not a function of history, but only the number that was there at the previous time. So that translates into, if you ask the question, what is the probability that is an individual is infected at time t when it enters the class, is still infected at time x. So if they're infected for all the time between t and x. This is just a function of x and not for how long they have been in that compartment. For that reason, these, this is an exponential distribution of waiting times in each compartment. This has no memory. And that's important. This is called a Poisson assumption. And the fact that it has no memory is a very crucial assumption in that goes into making the, this model simple and easy to deal with. This basically says that suppose I've already been sick for five days. What is the probability that I'm going to be sick for another five days? The answer is the same as the probability in the beginning because there is no memory. The system doesn't know at all. Okay? That's a very interesting feature only of this particular choice of rate. This is not the biologically sensible choice. Normally, biologically sensible would be say that, look, the time that you're ill is some distribution that peaks at a certain value and might have a tail onto this side. This is what the same exponential function looks like. It's a function that goes down like this. But here are a bunch of different formula, all of which seem to have peaks here and come down. And this is some data, which is distribution of incubation times in human infections with plasmodium vivax, etc. So I couldn't find exactly the data appropriate for this. But you can see that an assumption that gives you a curve like this is very different from an assumption that gives you a curve like this. The difficulty is that a curve like this needs to worry about memory. You need to know how long have I been in that compartment. Have I been in that compartment for so long? Well, I'm not going to leave it now. Have I been in that compartment for so long? It's time for me to leave that compartment. Have I been in the compartment for so long? I should definitely have left that compartment. But these assumptions will not hold for the simple rates that I wrote down for you. You can do more complicated things. For example, if you assume, all you can assume is that, look, this is some function that must be zero, must be one at time t equal to zero. I must be in the compartment at time t equal to zero. At time t equal to infinity, I must have left the compartment. I don't want to be permanently ill. So these two limits exist on that. But the function should be a function that doesn't increase. If I, want, I should not go up. But it's a non-increasing piecewise continuous function. It's the time that I spent in the compartment here. And from that, the rate of which I leave the compartment to the minus sign times dp by dt. The waiting time in the compartment, the mean waiting time is t times this particular rate here, which is the integral dt of p of t. Okay? So that gives me the mean waiting time in the compartment. In the earlier case, for the simple rate equation that I wrote down, that mean waiting time is 1 by gamma for that susceptible, for the infected susceptible transition. If you have these more complicated delays, you get much more complicated mathematical models. They are sort of integral or integral differential equations, and they are much, much more messier to deal with. So for this reason, most people prefer the simple SIR model, even though it cannot be the real truth and model that particular assumption. Or you have to choose another way of doing it. For example, you can do it through computer simulation of various types. But that reduces the analytic beauty and simplicity of the original SIR model equations. Here are a bunch of definitions that are useful to us. When we talked about R0, we assumed that, the, that the, in one infected person that you was, had was sat in the population for the whole infectious period and kept mixing with that population in exactly the same way. That's not completely true. Suppose I fall ill. What am I going to do? I'm going to stay at home, cover my head with a wet towel and drink lots of fruit juice or something. I reduce my contacts with other people precisely as I encounter my infections. 
So that reduction of contact with other people is not taken into account in this model. But that's potentially something that I ought to be able to include in it. The second thing that went in is, is the definition of something called a contact number, which is the average number of adequate contacts of a typical infected during the infectious period. So this is really R0 in its original sense. Okay? Because if adequate contacts is contacts that can give you a transmission of infection to a susceptible person, during the infectious period is a period D. Typical infective and in terms of average contact is the C bar. So this really is the same object here, except that in principle this accounts for changes in behavior, changes in contact patterns, etc., etc., etc. So that's how these things are related. The last definition is something called the replacement number or sometimes the, re repro the reproduction number. We started off with the basic reproductive ratio or the basic reproduction number. number. Now we have a simple reproduction number. And that's the average number of secondary infections produced by typical infective during the entire period of infectiousness. This is subtly different from the first definition. The first definition says, take a person who is infected, put them in a completely susceptible population, assume that they mix uniformly with everybody else, and find out the number of infections that they give rise to. This says that, look, look at them across time, across the period that they remain infected. In the first day, they might have infected 10 susceptible people. In the second day, it might be 5. Then their behavior has changed. They might infect 3. They might infect 2. Find the average of this number across the period that they're in the population and call that the reproduction number. And the relationships between these are that R0, sigma, and R are all equal at the beginning of the spread of the disease. Strictly speaking, R0 is defined only at the time of invasion, where you have an infected person in a completely susceptible population. But all of these other quantities, sigma and r, are defined at all times. They account for the fact that you can change your contact, you can change from people that are more infected people in the population, and so on. For most models, sigma remains constant as the infection spread, is equal to the basic reproduction number, because it doesn't change many things here. But r, which is the actual number of secondary cases from a typical infected, typically goes down. Because now, among the people you encounter are people who are either already infected and no deal another infection from you, or they're people who are recovered from the infection. So your whole environment is now changing. So of course, after this invasion, the fraction is less than one. So not all adequate contacts result in a new case. So R is always lesser than sigma or R0 after this invasion. I'm making these definitions because these are sometimes more useful from a clinical or public health perspective when you think about a disease. That is not just some idealized value of R0. Imagine that everybody is completely susceptible. I'm going to add one infected person. But this actually deals with the you know, dirty realities of the fact that you have contacts. Those contacts will change in time. You will encounter more people who have already been infected. Therefore, the, your ability to transfer an infection will therefore decrease. So in many senses, this particular number R is more useful than the idealized R0 that we started out with. Okay. All right, so let me stop here now. I have about 10 minutes to go. Let me just stop here because I can continue these discussions. We have to do much more along the lines of these models. And let me take some questions at this point. There are about 8 to 10 minutes left for questions. So what we've done is we've done the very basic motivation behind writing down the SIR model. I hope now you have understood what are compartmental models. The reason I did it very slowly was to make sure that we understood every assumption that was made in this, the reasons for writing down those particular equations, the, the justification behind gamma, why beta over gamma was dimensionless, why the single dimensionless number was enough to capture the behavior of these three equations, what the epidemic looks like, an epidemic of a sudden increase from a small value to a large value of the number of infected, how does that change with R0, it shifts backward as well as the peak actually increases, what are different definitions of reproduction number, how do they change with time. These are all questions that we actually dealt with. And as we go on, what we would like to do is ask a little more mathematical questions. What is the nature of that peak? Can we calculate that peak? How many are infected? As I make my model more complicated, as I have an exposed state or a carrier state, etc., how do my basic ideas behind the SIR model, how do they actually change? And can we look, for example, at what are phase-phase plots for I and S in order to understand where does this idea of a reproductive ratio and of a critical value of the reproductive ratio actually come from. Can we compare this to actual data, the clinical data, or disease data, epidemiological data, to understand what the behavior is? These are all questions that we will deal with in the next lecture. Which is, I don't teach tomorrow, I teach the day after, and then again from Friday and Saturday. So let's spend the last five minutes or so
in questions. So if you have questions, ask, ask them now. We can discuss them further. Yeah. Um, so that's a very good question. And we'll come to the way of how do you calculate beta and gamma? How do you calculate a reproductive ratio? Usually, gamma is known through some feature of the disease itself. The gamma is basically the time that you remain in the, I mean, 1 over a gamma is a time period. And that refers to the time that you spend in the infectious compartment. So that really has to do with the disease and the individual. You know, typically, you recover from a viral disease like the flu or something within 4 to 5 days. So gamma would be 1 by 5, or 1 by 5th of a day in that particular way of writing it. Beta is a little more complicated because we looked at what went into beta. That reflects social structure. How many people do you come into contact with, do you interact with? It reflects the duration of the infection. How long do you remain infectious? And the time you remain infectious can be different from the time that you feel sick, as we emphasized. So there is that part, as well as the productivity of your contacts. You may have 200 contacts, but maybe only one is productive enough to give, you, give the infection to another person. So usually estimating beta is hard. Estimating gamma is easier. But often people don't estimate beta and gamma separately. They try to estimate R0. And the way they do that is to look at how the infection increases. If you look at the initial part, for example, of the Ebola curve, it started off small and then it began to take off. That initial taking off part is usually exponential growth. As I said, the whole question behind that, the, the courtier and the king who was putting in the right, is that you have an exponential increase in the number. And that is a function of the R0. So you can look at data of that form and try and infer what is the R0 from the rate at which that curve is increasing. And that's how normally it is done in a clinical context, not by estimating beta and gamma separately. So there, so nothing, no distributions are normal here. If you look, if, even in the distribution of the infected, it goes up sharply, but then it has a longish tail on this side. You're right. If I, if I knew what the form of the distribution was, I can find beta and gamma from there, but I have no analytic form that tells me what is the i that can. If I could have an analytic form that represented the i completely as a function of beta and gamma, then I would have everything that I needed to determine what is beta and gamma separately. But again, remember that there it's only beta divided by gamma and not beta by gamma separately, because we know that we can always get rid of gamma. The only quantity in those equations is beta divided by gamma. So, so that's a little more complicated to answer, but which order of differential equation, that essentially comes into a Markov assumption that says, if I know the number of susceptible infected at this time, I know the number at the next time. I don't need to know the history behind that. If I have a higher order term, for example, d2s by dt squared or dts by dt squared, that's essentially saying that I need some memory of the past. I can, the equation that have these integral differential kernels on the right hand side are equations that can also be interpreted as having higher order derivative terms on the left hand side. That sort of mathematically that can be done. They, all that they do is introduce memory. And it's that memory that is important for distinguishing. So these, this just says that in order to determine at the next time how many are susceptible infected, all, I, all you need to tell me are susceptible infected at this time. That's all that I need to know. So that's where that assumption comes in. Sorry, I'll just, I'll just answer that question. So the difference is that the, the basic reproductive ratio is defined classically as the number of secondary cases when you introduce one infected person into a completely susceptible population. Okay. What actually happens is, once that person begins to infect other people, the number of persons he or she can infect decreases. Because now there are people who are already infected, and there are people who have already recovered. So if you ask over the course of infection, how many persons does this initial person manage to infect? On the first day, it may be everybody he comes into contact with. On the second day, it may be one-fifth the number of people he comes into contact with. Because everybody else, other people have already become infected and can't be given the infection again. So that averaging that, the number of people you can transmit the disease to over the course of the disease, 
gives rise to the reproduction number that I define later. It's less than the basic reproductive ratio because that is sets the upper limit. If everybody was always susceptible and you know, the moment you, they became infected, they went back to being susceptible, then these numbers would be the same. But this accounts for the fact that people are becoming uh, infected and therefore cannot be given the infection again. Sorry, go ahead. Hundred percent, but that's the difference between a mathematical reply and a reply that's useful for epidemiologists. You're right. The existence is you can the existence is guaranteed by mathematical theorems. Hundred percent. But if you ask, give me a closed form expression for the number of infected people at time t, which reproduces this curve in terms of just one quantity, which is r naught. If you can't come up with that, then I have nothing to compare my experimental data with. Ideally, I would like to plot my experimental data along with that I curve and then change my R naughts until I can get perfect fit along with that I curve. In practice, that is what I might do, except that I will do it using numerical methods or using a computer program rather than analytically. But you are right, I know that the solution exists, it is guaranteed to exist, but I do not know what it is. So, we are going to talk a little bit about that. There are other techniques to deal with populations that are not well mixed. One is certainly networks, where who you can give an infection to is determined by your network connectivity with the other person. And the second is the area that I am interested in, which is agent-based modeling of diseases. And so there, an agent is an idealization of an individual in a population. And typically, the agent can convert, convey the, the disease to people who, they, who are surrounding the agent nearby. So that includes the fact that you need not be able to have be a well-mixed population in one way. There are also more mathematical ways of doing it, which are along the line of these, essentially subdividing the population into many finer little groups and looking at transition between these two. The problem with that subdivision is that in principle you should have infinite subdivision, but that becomes very difficult to handle mathematically. So it's a question of tractability versus you know, accuracy. And there are many other assumptions here. And one certainly one important assumption is the assumption about this exponential decay or the Poisson assumption of time spent in each compartment. Yeah, so, they, so that's an important question. And as I said, it all goes back to this question here. If I define the force of infection lambda as ds by dt proportional to s, and lambda is a proportionality constant inside here, what I choose for lambda is what is central. Do I choose for lambda the number of infected people, in which case this is density dependent transmission, or do I choose for lambda the fraction of infected people, that is i divided by the total population size. So it's just a question of what is my choice for lambda. I have, uh, finally there has to be an i inside here, but is it i alone or is it i scaled to the population size, which is i divided by m. And here I gave an example of what might be the case, the logic behind this. Over here the rough logic is, that whether I talk about a small number of people, infected people 10 in a population of 10,000, or I multiply both numbers by 10, 100 infected in a population of 100,000, the situation should be roughly the same. That's what I would think. Huh? But over here, the lambda would change by a factor of 10 because i is changing by a factor of 10. Over here, lambda doesn't change because both i and n change by the same factor. So ultimately, what, this, what determines this is the fact that the number of contacts that I have doesn't change as I make my population larger and larger. So that's really the logic behind it. That's an important question and it's a question that people struggle with. What is the right form to take? And this is a form that is very natural to people who think about chemical reactions and chemical equations. And as I showed you in the earlier example, so all of the examples that you will see next week in systems biology typically use equations that are resemble the density dependent transmission. But in this particular clinical context, in the epidemiological context, this is the right assumption to take. No, because that is not a function of the disease, but a function of contacts. So the assumption that goes in here is that the number of people any individual person typically contacts is not a function of the total population size. I know 20 people, irrespective of whether 
Chennai has a population of 1 million or 5 million or 10 million or 100 million. I, whatever happens, I still know only about 20 to 100 people. That's the assumption that goes. And it has nothing to do with the disease as such. It has to do with the contacts between people and how I model that. No more questions? No. So that, that is determined by C, by the number of contacts. So the number of contacts, finally, the only thing, the number of contacts can increase. If I have lots of people surrounding me, maybe my number of contacts goes from 20 to 100. But it doesn't depend upon the total population size, which may be 1 million or 10 million or 100 million. So that will change. The contacts between people will change the value of beta. Hmm. But there can be no dependence upon the overall population size. So this really removes that factor that depended upon the overall population size.